Okay. Um, we'll start uh, with uh, Radio Free Europe, gentleman in the middle. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Secretary uh, General. Uh, Mustafa Sarra from Radio Free Europe. Uh, do you see real and serious uh, compromises made by the Taliban uh, on the peace efforts uh, ahead of uh, the group's traditional spring offensive uh, season in Afghanistan. And uh, there was a high-profile attack uh, in Kabul this morning. Uh, what does it mean in terms of security? Thank you. I strongly condemn uh, the uh, attack in Kabul this morning. It uh, shows uh, once again uh, the consequences of uh, horrendous violence against, uh, against innocent uh, uh, civilians. And it also demonstrates uh, the strong need to find a peaceful uh, uh, solution to the conflict in Afghanistan. And that's exactly, what we, uh, that's exactly why we continue to provide strong support to the Afghan security forces, because we believe uh, and we are convinced that the best way for NATO to create the conditions for peace is to support, train, assist, and advise the Afghan security forces so then, so, so they are able to, to send a clear message to, to uh, Taliban, to terrorists, uh, uh, that they will never win on the battlefield. And they have to sit down uh, at the negotiating table and make real compromises, uh, reduce violence, and engage in the inter-Afghan dialogue to, uh, to create a lasting uh, peace. We hope that we can see progress as soon as possible. And that's exactly what we are working for, and that's also why we are uh, consulting, of course, closely between all allies and also with the US and the US envoy uh, uh, negotiating with the Taliban, uh, Ambassador Khalisad. Uh, this will be an important issue uh, to be addressed and discussed among allies uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow when we uh, meet, uh, because we are pushing for progress uh, on the peace pro process as soon as possible. Let me also add that we went into Afghanistan together, all allies and partners. We will make decisions on the adjustment of uh, force levels together, and one day we will leave together. Because we are not in Afghanistan to stay there forever, we are there to create the conditions for peace and to enable the Afghan security forces uh, to protect themselves uh, without our help. Uh, Washington Post. Hi, Michael Birnbaum for the Washington Post. Thanks very much. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, a couple days ago there was a, a Pew study uh, released about public attitudes toward NATO and in a bunch of different countries. It showed that uh, opinions, favorability of, of NATO was dropping sharply in, in lots of European countries, also in the United States. And I wanted to ask you why you thought that was, and is it connected to President Trump's uh, politicization of, of uh, you know, support for NATO? Thank you. Well, I think the overall message from that uh, opinion poll is that it, it's, it's strong support for NATO. Uh, uh, overall, uh, across uh, uh, NATO allied uh, countries. Then, of course, it goes a bit up and down and it varies a bit uh, between different allies and uh, uh, from year to year uh, 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 in different allied uh, countries. So, for instance, the UK, it goes up and the US is at gone uh, a, a bit down, but still at a high uh, level. So I think it just illustrates that we are 29 democracies where there are different views and different opinions. And of course, they uh, vary a bit uh, between allies and, uh, and over uh, uh, time. Uh, but the overall me message uh, uh, from that opinion poll, but also from other opinion polls, is, is a, a, a continued strong uh, commitment uh, to uh, NATO and strong support uh, to uh, NATO. Uh, so. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's that. Uh, and, and let me add that one thing is, uh, is opinion polls, and of course they are important because we are democracies, and the only way NATO can remain the strongest alliance in, in, in the world is that, is that we have public support from the people in the countries uh, which are a member of the alliance, uh, and, and we have that. Uh, but at the same time, the uh, collected defense. Uh, uh, clauses, the collective defense commitments of NATO is treaty commitments by all allies. So they, they, are, they, they are in place regardless of whether the opinion polls goes a bit up and down. Uh, 
uh, we, are, uh, we are committed to defend uh, each other. Okay, we'll go to the gentleman in the front row here, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Yuri Shiko Ducevelli. I have two questions. First question is on Ukraine, because the Ukrainian minister will be here, you said. Uh, so, uh, Ukraine asked uh, to be granted enhanced opportunities partnership uh, status. So, uh, what is, I understand there, is, uh, there are discussions still ongoing, but what can you say to these discussions and uh, when could be any decisions made on this? The second is on this response to Russian's new missile systems. Uh, when uh, this Pack, a response package will be uh, adopted. Could you explain a little bit more what, what could be in that package? And is there uh, this uh, response to this new avant-garde hypersonic missile there? I mean, what can NATO do about this uh, avant-garde system? Thank you. Um, uh, we will meet uh, with the Ukrainian Defense uh, Minister. Uh, uh, we will have a, uh, there will be a breakfast hosted by uh, the Canadian uh, Defense Minister for all NATO allies, and then uh, uh, we will uh, meet with the uh, Ukrainian Defense Minister and uh, discuss uh, the importance of uh, continuing uh, the reform process, but also, of course, uh, uh, express our strong uh, support to Ukraine, uh, political support, practical support, uh, and, uh, and, of course, uh, support for the efforts to find a peaceful uh, uh, solution to the uh, conflict. And, uh, and NATO allies uh, uh, are committed to supporting Ukraine. Uh, we welcome the progress we have seen uh, to try to find a peaceful uh, solution. And, uh, and uh, I visited the whole North Atlantic Council, visited uh, Ukraine not so many uh, also last fall. And then we, for instance, visited also the Naval Academy in Odessa, uh, where we have uh, NATO trainers, uh, where we also then help them to build uh, uh, naval capabilities, uh, just one example of how we are working together to help Ukraine modernize their armed forces and, uh, and, uh, and uh, modernize their defense and security institutions. Then uh, I think we have to understand that the SSC-8 uh, missiles and uh, also the other new missiles, partly uh, already deployed and partly under development, like for instance uh, uh, Vanguard, uh, 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 they are part of a broader pattern we have seen uh, in Russia over several years with uh, heavy investments in new modern uh, uh, military capabilities, uh, nuclear and conventional, uh, new modern uh, uh, missiles, and NATO has already started to respond to this. Because we have increased the readiness of forces, we have, uh, for the first time in our history, deployed uh, combat ready troops to the eastern part of the alliance. Uh, we uh, have increased our presence in the air, on land and at sea. And we are investing in new modern capabilities, including in air defense systems uh, and the missile defense. Uh, so uh, air and missile defense uh, is one of the strands we are now looking into what more we can do. Uh, we are also looking into conventional capabilities, uh, exercises, uh, but also arms control, because we strongly believe that the best answer to this is to have effective arms control, to make sure that we uh, avoid a new big arms race. Uh, it is dangerous and it's costly. But as long as Russia does, uh, does not respect existing agreements like the INF agreement, then of course there is no way that we can uh, maintain that uh, treaty, uh, because a treaty that is only respected on one side doesn't keep us safe. Uh, so we are working on different strands. We have already started the adaptation of uh, uh, NATO. It has actually been going on for some time. We will continue to look into uh, areas as, as uh, conventional air and missile defense uh, exercises. And we also are already investing uh, more in new modern uh, capabilities. Uh, the, the last thing I will say is that we will not mirror what Russia is doing. We have no intention of deploying new nuclear uh, land-based uh, uh, weapon systems in Europe, but we have to make sure that we maintain uh, credible deterrence and defense also in a world uh, without the INF Treaty and with more Russian missiles. Okay. We have the lady in the front row. 
Uh, Mr. General Secretary, I am uh, also Ukrainian correspondent from Ukraine TV channel, and uh, you know that our country uh, has ambitions to become full-fledged member of uh, North Atlantic uh, Threat Organization. Uh, what home task uh, should we do eventually to achieve this goal? Uh, and uh, I mean long-term and short-term also. Well, I think the main focus of Ukraine is what Ukraine has clearly stated itself, and that is on reform, to modernize, uh, to improve, uh, to meet NATO standards. That's good for Ukraine, and that will uh, strengthen your defense and security uh, capabilities, your defense and security institutions, and we help you with that. We provide support, we have uh, trust funds, we have trainers, we have uh, uh, ways to uh, NATO allies provide uh, different kinds of support. NATO provides uh, support uh, on command and control, on cyber, on fighting corruption, on modernizing your uh, defense institutions. So we work with you uh, to help you meet NATO standards and modernize and strengthen your defense and, uh, and, and security institutions. And also NATO allies provide training. And I just refer to the Naval Academy where we have uh, NATO uh, 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 trainers uh, helping uh, you. Uh, uh, so that's the focus, and I think that's also the best way to move towards uh, NATO mem membership. So there are, you should do it anyway, uh, but the good thing of, uh, uh, because if, when you modernize and, and, and reform, you are strengthening your own institutions, but by doing that, you're also moving closer to a membership. I met uh, President uh, Zelensky, uh, uh, Zelensky, and I uh, uh, had a very good meeting with him also long ago, and we have a very good dialogue on the importance of reform and the importance of NATO and NATO allies continuing to provide support uh, to Ukraine. Okay, we'll go with uh, Anna Dolu over there, lady on the third row. Thank you, Secretary General, Anadolu Agency, Sheriff Echetin. I'd like to know whether you expect the situation in Idlib to come up at the ministerial, and what is your personal opinion on the recent increase of attacks by the Syrian regime and it's supported by Russia? Thank you. I'm very concerned about the situation in Idlib uh, because uh, we have seen uh, horrendous uh, attacks against civilians. Uh, we have seen uh, again that hundreds of thousands of people have been forced to flee. And uh, we have seen uh, indiscriminate sh shelling uh, of uh, uh, also civilian targets. And uh, uh, we condemn this uh, because we condemn indiscriminate uh, uh, attacks against uh, also civilian uh, uh, targets. Uh, and. Uh, uh, therefore, we call on uh, Assad uh, and uh, Russia, because Russia provides support to the Assad regime, to stop these attacks, uh, to respect international law, uh, and to fully support uh, the UN efforts to try to find a peaceful uh, solution. This is urgent because people are suffering today as we speak. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people are forced once again to flee. And, uh, and therefore, the Russian-backed regime, uh, Assad regime, has to stop uh, this uh, uh, killing, this uh, horrendous attack of uh, innocent people in uh, Idlib. And I expect, of course, this to be an issue that uh, Allied ministers will raise uh, during the ministerial. Um, Wall Street Journal, gentleman in the last row. And Thank you. James Marston of the Wall Street Journal. Secretary General, do you feel like you have a clear understanding of what uh, President Trump actually wants NATO allies to do in, uh, in Iraq and the Middle East? Um, and can you give us some more specifics on what is actually being discussed um, for, for NATO to actually do? Because Trump has been quite uh, vague in his, in, 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 in his public statements. <coughs> President Trump has been very clear uh, on two messages uh, regarding uh, NATO uh, from uh, he, uh, the day he became president. Uh, and I, in my first uh, conversation with him, uh, uh, so a few weeks after he took office, he had two messages. Uh, message number one was about burden sharing, defense spending, and message number two was about the need for NATO to do more uh, uh, fighting terrorism. 
On burden sharing, we are making significant progress. Uh, allies will have added 400 billion extra US dollars for defense spending by the end of uh, 2024, based on the current plans. Um, uh, uh, we are also stepping up when it comes to uh, fighting terrorism, but I think we have a potential to do uh, more. Um, uh, we already play an important role in Afghanistan. Uh, we have the training mission in Iraq. We work with partners, uh, Jordan and, and, uh, and, and Tunisia, and other partners in uh, the region. Um, uh, for instance, I recently visited a joint training center we have uh, in Kuwait. Uh, so, so NATO allies and NATO already play a role in the, in the region uh, and, uh, and in the fight against uh, terrorism. But we can do more, and now we actually discuss that. Uh, and President Trump has uh, expressed a clear uh, uh, wish for uh, more support from NATO. Uh, we have a good dialogue uh, among NATO allies. And of course, also with the countries uh, uh, concerned, for instance, Iraq, uh, on how we can do this, how we can do more. Uh, but uh, we will announce decisions when we make them. So I think it's a bit uh, early for me to announce any specific decisions. But we are looking into, for instance, what more we can do uh, in Iraq when it comes to training. Uh, we believe that one of the best weapons we have in the fight against terrorism is to train local forces, enabling them to fight terrorism them themselves. Uh, prevention is better than intervention, and, uh, and NATO has a long experience in doing exactly that. You have to remember that in Afghanistan we had a big combat operation, more than 130,000 troops. Now we are there with 60,000 troops uh, training and helping the Afghans so they can fight terrorism themselves. Uh, and our aim is not to stay in these countries forever. Our aim is to enable these countries to stabilize their own countries and, 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 and then uh, reduce or eventually leave. Uh, but, uh, but we have to make sure that when we leave, uh, we don't create the conditions for ISIS to return or international terrorists to return, but that we have created uh, strong local, uh, national uh, institutions that can uh, protect and defend uh, themselves. Deutsche uh, Welle NPR, lady at the back. Yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, acknowledging the strong signal that Defender 2020 sends, at the same time we saw the U.S. budget proposal yesterday and the Pentagon's request for the European Defense Initiative is down for the second year in a row. So I wanted to know if, if that concerns you at all. They say that some projects are completed. At the same time, I'm sure you'd like to see the spending stay up. And at the same time, the Munich Security Conference's uh, report was, was released, which says that these debates over funding and possible reduced funding is a signal of a lack of continued faith in the West, this Westlessness term that we're going to hear so much about. Do you, uh, do you believe that? Thanks. So what we see is a strong U.S. commitment to European security, uh, and we have seen that actually uh, uh, not uh, also over years, but we have seen it uh, in words, but also in deeds, uh, with more U.S. presence. Uh, and the European Detention Initiative is, uh, of course, helping to finance this. Um, but, uh, of course, the U.S. is also providing support to Europe uh, in other ways than through the European Detention Initiative. Um, so the, the, the U.S. security guarantees for Europe is not only uh, dependent on relying on the European Detention Initiative, it actually relies on the full capacity of the U.S. armed forces. Uh, and that's much more than the European Detention Initiative. Uh, the European Detention Initiative and the funding for that uh, increased significantly, then it, uh, it has gone uh, uh, somewhat down again, but, but, but it's still at a high level, and it's still important to finance uh, exercises, infrastructure in uh, Europe. And uh, 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 the exercise uh, Defender, um, the Europe Defender 20, is, uh, is the biggest exercise, or is the exercise that will uh, uh, include the biggest number of U.S. Uh, troops deployed to Europe uh, for decades. So for me, that's uh, just another example of that the U.S. is committed to NATO and to European uh, security. So I think it's quite natural that when you have big investments projects, when they are finished, and of course there is less money for uh, investment because you have finished, finished the, 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 the projects, so the main message is that, well, uh, the, European, the, uh, the, the money for the European uh, deterrence initiatives goes a, a bit up and down. It varies a bit, but overall it's still significant. 
and if you add all the other uh, US capabilities which are relevant for NATO, uh, and you see what the US actually do in uh, Europe with more troops than I had for many years, I'm confident that the US is committed to European security. We'll go to... Yeah, Westlessness, well, uh, I will speak about that when I go to Munich later in the week, but, 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 but for me, if, that, if, that's, if, if the question is whether the West, meaning uh, North America and Europe and also partners, which are in many places in the world, whether we still are strong, whether we still are capable and able to defend our values, my answer is yes. Uh, if, if you ask me whether that's easy, no, of course it's not easy. And it's not straightforward, and, 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 and of course sometimes we see differences and disagreements between allies. I think I've, I've stated again and again, yes, there are differences on issues like trade, climate change, uh, and so on. But when it comes to NATO and security, the reality is that North America and Europe are doing more together now than we've done for decades. The U.S. is increasing their presence in Europe, and European allies and Canada are uh, stepping up. So for me, this is not an example of that the, the West has lost its way. It actually uh, proves that, yes, there are differences, there are difficulties, uh, and, and sometimes we, 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 we struggle, but the reality is that uh, uh, the, we need the West, we need the transatlantic bond uh, as much as uh, ever, and therefore uh, I welcome the fact that we actually are able to prove that we stand together. We'll go for a couple of questions to the upper tier, Agence France Presse. <coughs> Gentleman with glasses. Yeah. Thanks. Oui, bonjour. C'est votre petit moment en français, si je peux me permettre. You can stop. Okay. Yeah. Euh, le président français Emmanuel Macron a souhaité que le nouvel instrument qui sera appelé à remplacer le traité FNI soit négocié avec les Européens, c'est-à-dire que les Européens puissent faire entendre leur voix sur un nouveau traité qui va remplacer quelque chose qui avait été conclu simplement entre les Russes et les Américains. Est-ce que vous pensez que ce soit discuté ici et est-ce que c'est souhaitable Et une petite question après qui a trait avec l'opinion de Pew. Je voudrais savoir que vous inspire le dernier commentaire du président Trump lorsqu'il a dit que NATO... Je mets mes lunettes, excusez-moi, parce que c'est en anglais. NATO was going down like a rocket ship before he took office. Je voudrais savoir ce que ça vous inspire comme réflexion. Merci. First on the INF uh, Treaty, I think the demise of the INF Treaty, uh, which is a bad and negative thing, shows the importance and the strength of NATO. Uh, because uh, what we saw was that when Russia started to violate the INF Treaty many years ago, uh, we actually started also to have close consultations within NATO on how to deal with that. And NATO has been a platform that has brought together uh, European allies and uh, uh, the United States uh, to find a way forward uh, where we were, have been united on how to deal with uh, the Russian violations of the INF uh, Treaty. We all know that, of course, the INF Treaty is a bilateral arrangement between Russia and, uh, and the United uh, States because we speak about Russian and uh, US uh, missiles. Uh, but, of course, it affects European allies because these missiles were deployed, the SS-20 and the Pershing and cruise missiles, which triggered the INF Treaty back in 1987, they were deployed on European soil. Uh, so, of course, uh, President Macron is right when he says that this also affects uh, European allies. And that's exactly why it is so important that we have NATO as the platform where we have consulted on these issues closely for many years. Um, uh, uh, it started during the Obama administration uh, because it was the Obama administration that first raised the concerns about Russian violations, uh, Russia, Russian deployment of the new SSC-8 missiles, and then it has continued uh, under the current administration. Um, and the reality is that um, we have agreed on every step. First, uh, we all agreed, all allies agreed, that Russia was violating the treaty. 
and we raised that issue with Russia again and again. Uh, and this was not only based on intelligence from one ally, but from several allies. And then we agreed that we called on Russia to come back into compliance. Uh, Russia did not come back into compliance. Then we set the time limit, uh, and Russia didn't come back to the compliance. The, and then we all agreed on the US uh, decision to withdraw, because a, a, a treaty which is only respected by one side doesn't work. And then we have agreed, uh, after close, close consultations, on uh, the way forward, including the work which, which is now being done related to uh, uh, issues related to air and missile defense, conventional exercises, and uh, so on. So we will uh, continue to consult, continue to agree, uh, and work together uh, uh, on a balanced and defensive response uh, to the Russian violation of the INF Treaty. So my message on the INF Treaty is that it is very bad that uh, we have seen the demise of the treaty because of the Russian violation of the treaty, but it's actually good to see how NATO has been able to respond to that in a coordinated and united way. So it shows the importance and the strength of NATO being the platform bringing Europe and North America uh, together addressing these kind of strategic uh, 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 issues. Uh, then, uh, then, uh, then yeah, on, so Pre President Trump has been very clear and outspoken uh, about NATO many, many times. Uh, but I also welcome the fact that he recognizes the progress European allies and Canada are now making on uh, uh, burden-sharing defense spending. Uh, not least at the uh, leaders' meeting in uh, London in uh, December, he clearly expressed uh, the prog uh, recognition of the progress we are uh, making. And uh, I also welcome the fact that we now are working together, all NATO allies, uh, on how NATO can do more uh, in uh, uh, the fight against terrorism, including in the uh, Middle East uh, uh, region. Okay, closing times, gentlemen on the fifth row, yeah. The Jordan Times. I have a follow-up question. Uh, U.S. President is asking for more NATO involvement in the Middle East. At a time you shifted some of your personnel out of Iraq and you last month suspended training in Iraq. What would more involvement in the Middle East mean for regional allies? In this case, I'm referring to Jordan, and would that be discussed in the coming few days? Thank you. Yes, it will be discussed. Uh, and uh, we will discuss uh, uh, many aspects uh, of this uh, challenge, meaning we will discuss what we do in Iraq, but we will also look into what we can do beyond Iraq. Uh, we already have, uh, 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 so we are all, all are working with Jordan. Uh, we, the, the King of Jordan visited NATO a few weeks ago, and uh, NATO is, uh, is working with Jordan on uh, uh, issues like uh, uh, special operation forces, intelligence, and, uh, and other things. And of course, Jordan is important for, uh, for the whole region because Jordan has been uh, a key member of the global coalition to defeat uh, Daesh and, 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 uh, and a close partner of, uh, of NATO. Um, uh, yeah, so we are looking into what, we are discussing what more NATO can do, but again, before we have made any final decisions, I think it's a bit early for me to announce uh, those uh, decisions, uh, but we will uh, see what more we can do. Yeah. Frankfurt Allgemeine. Thank you, Thomas Gutschka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Secretary General, on this same issue, uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, have you received a firm political commitment from the new Iraqi government that it wants foreign troops to remain operating on its soil uh, and especially want NATO to continue their presence? And the second question is, how do you assess the security situation on the ground right now, um, meaning when do you think the entire operations will be able to resume in Iraq? Yeah, yeah first of all, also that we have NATO personnel, NATO troops in Iraq as we now, as, as, as we speak. Uh, uh, we will resume uh, training as soon as uh, possible, but there are, there are, there is NATO personnel, NATO uh, trainers, uh, advisors in uh, Iraq. Uh, but for security reasons, both the Global Coalition and NATO suspended uh, training 
uh, <coughs> our aim is to resume that training as soon as uh, possible. We are in close uh, consultation uh, with the Iraqi government. Uh, I, spoke, uh, I have spoken with the Iraqi Prime Minister, with the Iraqi President, uh, with the Foreign Minister, uh, and uh, we are of course in close consultation with them because uh, we will only uh, uh, stay in Iraq uh, based on an inv invitation from Iraq. Uh, so, so we fully respect the territorial integrity, the sovereignty of uh, Iraq. Uh, we are there uh, based on the invitation from the Iraqi government, I think it was back in 2016, uh, and uh, all the legal uh, arrangements are uh, in place, uh, which, uh, uh, which has been there for a, a long a time for our training uh, uh, mission. I have spoken with, uh, with the Iraqi Prime Minister on these issues, and we are now looking into how we can uh, continue to provide uh, support, and, uh, and uh, uh, we have to understand that we do this because we have a common goal. Uh, and that is to uh, fight uh, uh, ISIS, Daesh, and to make sure that they never uh, return uh, and uh, threaten the people of Iraq, but also threaten uh, people in our own countries, in Germany and in all the NATO allied uh, countries. Uh, I, I would like to commend uh, Iraq for being at the forefront against, uh, in the fight against terrorism. They have made um, uh, huge sacrifices in that uh, fight. Uh, we support them, we will like to continue to support them, but we have to remember that the uh, biggest sacrifices are uh, made by the people of Iraq and the security forces of Iraq, and I commend them for their courage and the bravery they have shown. We'll go to the front, uh, Bobeda from Montenegro. Lady over there in black. Yeah. Jovan Juršić, Daily Newspaper, Pobjeda. Uh, first NATO counter-hybrid team was in Montenegro last, late last year, so can you tell me what was the task of this team, and was it in any way connected with the upcoming elections in Montenegro, as Mon Montenegrin authorities said? Thank you. Well, we, we agreed at the uh, NATO summit uh, in Brussels in 2018 to establish uh, um, uh, counter hybrid support teams uh, to assist allies uh, in preparing and responding to hybrid threats because we have seen uh, that hybrid threats has become uh, uh, more and more in reality for more and more NATO allied countries. Uh, this uh, uh, mixture of uh, covert and overt operations, military and non-military means of aggression, cyber and other uh, means of uh, uh, aggressive actions against uh, 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 NATO allied uh, uh, countries um, and at the request of the government of Montenegro we uh, deployed the first NATO counter hybrid support team uh, to Montenegro uh, uh, we did so in uh, November and they uh, 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 and they stay there for uh, uh, some days so uh, this is based on a request from the uh, government of uh, Montenegro and they are not longer in Montenegro uh, Kuna, third row, yeah. Uh, Nawab Khan from the Kuwait news agency, Kuna. Mr. Secretary General, how do you see the role of the Gulf countries like Kuwait in contributing to peace and security in the Middle East region? Thank you. We highly, highly value the uh, partnership, the cooperation we have with uh, countries in the Gulf region, uh, including uh, Kuwait. Uh, um, <clears throat> the North Atlantic Council and I, we visited Kuwait uh, in December uh, and uh, we uh, met with the political leadership, uh, we had uh, good uh, discussions uh, and uh, uh, we also uh, actually had the, some of our meetings uh, at the new uh, uh, regional center, the ICI uh, NATO uh, regional center in Kuwait, uh, which is uh, a clear demonstration of that uh, we are working together also on how we can uh, help and support each other and the center is a great success helping to train advise uh, uh, teach uh, uh, personnel from the region uh, and uh, and it's a concrete example of how Kuwait uh, supports the partnership between Kuwait and NATO okay uh, last question lady in the second row Uh, 
Tamar Gancharuska, Telma TV, uh, North Macedonia. Secretary General, North Macedonia has not adopted uh, Article 5 from the Washington Treaty in its uh, legislation due to the inability to pass the defense law in the parliament with two-thirds of majority. Until when can NATO wait for a nation to adopt a collective defense, which is a core value of the NATO, and is it acceptable for the NATO to pass this law with the old name of the army, Army of the Republic of Macedonia, on what current position insist? Thank you. Well, collective defense, Article 5, uh, will be a treaty obliga uh, obligation for North Macedonia as soon as North Macedonia becomes a full uh, member. Uh, we signed the accession protocol last year, and uh, soon uh, all NATO allies uh, will have uh, um, ratified the protocol in their parliaments. So, uh, so as soon as that happens, uh, uh, the treaty will apply for uh, uh, also North Macedonia, and. Uh, Article 5, collective defense, is, uh, is Article 5 of that treaty. So uh, then that will be a treaty obligation for also North Macedonia. Thank you very much. This concludes uh, this press conference. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.